our food comes from outside. Mm -hmm. There are bugs outside. Sometimes bugs end up in food and it's okay. So Uh, do we need like a cultural shift on that? I think we do. Imperfect produce. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. Bugs and food don't go together very well. But somebody's got to manage how that all goes down. So this week we're doing an episode that's a little bit different. We aren't talking with a farmer. The person that we interview doesn't grow any food herself. She is a bug scientist and she talks about bugs and food and how they're managed and some really cool new technology and research into how to manage bugs and you know, make sure that bad bugs go away and good bugs are around without using pesticides, using biological controls. Her name is Rebecca Schmidt. She is a bug scientist, an entomologist with the USDA in Wapato. She has cool stuff to share and more stories about how farmers that she works with so care about what they're trying to do in their field and are, are sensitive to a lot of things. Enjoy this conversation about bugs and hopefully some of the uh, bug stories don't uh, give you the (laughs) heebie-jeebies as we talked about in the episode. Also, thanks to our sponsors, Mana Insurance Group, uh, helping you protect your financial future rather than just pick up the pieces when things go wrong. You can check them out online, manainsurancegroup.com. And thank them as well for supporting the podcast and the work that they do. Also, not to just protect families and individuals, but farms and businesses as well. Also, the Dairy Farmers of Washington, wadairy.org is their website. They're constantly sharing great stories of things happening in the world of dairy and producing the delicious dairy products that come out of Washington State. Check them out again, wadairy.org. Big thank you to the Dairy Farmers of Washington for supporting the podcast. Now to Wapato at the USDA facility, research facility there to talk with entomologist, bug scientist, uh, Rebecca Schmidt here on the Real Food, Real People podcast. I'm Dylan Honkoop. This is my continuing journey to get to know the real people behind our food here in Washington state. So your life is bugs. That, that, you're an entomologist, yes, which yes. means you're a bug scientist. I'm a bug scientist. Explain what that is. Oh, man. Well, I mean, so we've got all different kinds. We come on all flavors of bug science, uh, some of which are actual flavors. You can eat some kinds of insects. Nice. Uh, yes. So we've got people that do work on that, on insect uh, eating or entomophagy. Uh, we've got people that work on medical and veterinary entomology, so work on the diseases that insects can cause to either us or to our farm animals or our pets. Mm. Uh, we have people that do really basic ecology work with insects and look at how they affect the environment, insect conservation. Um, tons of other things that I'm leaving out because it'd be an exhaustive long list. And then we come to me, which is working in agricultural entomology. Which means what? Like the bugs that are, I would assume, mostly a problem in like people growing food. And out here in eastern Washington, that's going to be a lot of like tree fruit and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I I like to couch my job because I I consider myself fortunate in that I get to work with the charismatic predators that everybody likes. So I say I work on the bugs that eat the bugs that eat the food. The bugs that eat the bugs that eat the food. So the the good bugs. The good bugs. So yeah, I'm a a good bug specialist. My dad, because my dad's a red raspberry farmer. He drilled this into me at a fairly young age. Where he's like, not all bugs are bad. And if we may need to go out there and kill some bugs, but we need to think about we don't want to kill the good bugs if we can at all avoid it. Yeah, yeah. So what are the good bugs? Oh, man. So they come in all different, again, all the flavors of bugs. Uh, so, I mean, everybody knows lady beetles That's the or mm-hmm. ladybugs. That's yeah. the one that everybody can recognize, at least the, the more com- common ones. Yeah. Um, but then we've got uh, insects called lace wings, which have very delicate, mm-hmm. clear, lacy-looking wings when they're adults. As juveniles, they are vicious little predators. I mm-hmm. call them sideways alligators because instead of their mouth going up and down like this, they've got sort of that same shape, but it's sideways. Oh, uh, and they really? they never stop eating. It seems like when we have them in the lab and are watching them, they're always trying to eat something. But the important part is they're not eating the fruit or the plant. They're exactly. eating other bugs. Exactly. Anything soft, squishy, and smaller than they are is fair game for them as predators. So nice. they're they're pretty pretty epic little guys. Just like an alligator. Anything yeah. that's 
soft, squishy, and smaller than them. They'll get it, yeah. <laughs> Not that I've ever had experience with an alligator. I lived in South Carolina for a while, so I have had experience Yikes. with alligators. Yikes, Yikes. no oh, thank I you. Love, I love gators. I think, I think they're <laughs> precious. I, ca- I call them like dinosaur puppies. Yep. I, I just yeah. like predators. I'm a predator nerd, <laughs> so all the sizes of predators are good predators for me. Uh, so if we we, give, we have those more traditional, those are what people think of when they think of beneficial insects. Um, but we can go the whole gamut of there are um, flies, hoverflies, that look a lot like bees. I'm sure people mm. have seen them at their flowers, whether, whether they've realized it or not. Right. Uh, those, uh, you know, as, they're, as adults, they're flying around just like bees do and pollinating and sipping up nectar. As juveniles, there are several species of those flies that will lay their eggs next to aphid populations. So if they see a nice cluster on a leaf... Mm. Mm-hmm. Target it. Egg hatches. Little, uh, it's a maggot. Little maggot hatches out, and it says, "I am exactly where I want to be." And they are vicious little killers when they're so they born. They eat the aphids. They eat the aphids. They actually have um, what we call rasping mouth parts. So think of like a cat's tongue, but mm-hmm. at a, a scale where the cat's your size. And it's trying to it it licks them to death basically, and it kind of uses that to, to no slurp up the good the goodies. So okay, let's talk about the bad bugs a minute though. Like, why do they need to be eaten? What are they doing? Like, a- you mentioned aphids, and like that's what I think of with lady beetles, ladybugs too. Is like they eat aphids. You have an aphid problem. Well, yeah, there are a bunch of different pesticides you could use, but there's also ladybugs that you could deploy potentially to eat them. But what's the matter with aphids? What do they do? Why do they need to be eaten? So we've got, um, especially if we're talking tree fruit, we've got two big different kinds of pests that we typically deal with, with some exceptions. One are, one are called indirect pests, which means they're feeding on the part that we're not so concerned about economically. So basically anything that's not the apple, the pear, the cherry. Yeah. But that's still going to hurt the health of the tree. Like it's basically, they're, you know, they're sucking sap out of the tree. They could be, uh, in some cases, transmitting diseases, um, doing things like some aphids actually have toxic saliva. So they're, they're impacting the health of the tree without maybe in that same year seeing an impact on the fruit. And then you have what are called direct pests, and the classic one in tree fruit is the coddling moth, which lays its egg on the fruit, caterpillar hatches, and starts to feed. You get the proverbial worm in the apple. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so for either one of those, there's there are obviously big big issues to farmers. One is short term, very clear economic impact, and one is maybe longer term, might take you a few years to see, but you don't want it. And so basically what we've done when we've done our standard farming practices is to make it easier to put treatments on to manage fertility to harvest we create these huge swaths of something that's all the same because it's a pain in the butt to have pickers go in in the case of apples right. and say okay this tree is this particular kind right. of fruit and the next one's right. something different you have to keep it sorted uh, and that's what we call monoculture right and uh when you create monoculture especially for insects that are specialized to feed on that particular crop what you're basically saying is that thing you like in my case it would be like pizza if someone had a room full of pizza <laughs> that's the room i'm showing up yeah. in for these insects you're giving them Buffet. a room full of their absolute favorite thing they need to survive and, yeah. and so that is one of the reasons we cause pest problems by doing agriculture the way we do it yeah um so the balance gets thrown off of how things would normally happen in nature so your pest numbers shoot way up and so your goal with the with the position i do which is biological control right. is to try to bring that balance back to where you're having something that's not completely destroyed by the pest insect in question biological control could sound like oh a new you know softer way organic approach but that kind of stuff has been going on in farming for a long time, hasn't it? I'd say since the begin, big beginning of farming, we've yeah. been doing biological control, whether or not we've called it that, but that's, that's right. what it is. So, yeah, what, how does that work out on a farm in an orchard with farmers? What, if they say, well, we've got bugs, you're going to say, well, we're going to bring other bugs to get them? Like, how do you even do that? So there are... Um, I, I say three. You know, you can quibble over fine details. Three different kinds of biological control. And the main one that any farmer is going to rely on, whether again, whether or not they know they're doing it, is the, 
the base of the pyramid is conservation biological control. Mm. And that just means taking care of what's already present to make sure that it can build up populations and do its job for you. Um, so very early on, like the, the start of what I would call modern industrial agriculture, they were aware of, of they didn't call it it, but, but conservation biological control. Mm-hmm. And it primarily was based on this idea that, okay, I've got a choice of pesticides, and this was when they finally had some choices other than right. some, like three things. Yeah. Uh, I know this one hurts this important insect that I know is eating my pests. Mm-hmm. This one doesn't do as bad of a job at hurting that insect, but can still control the pest. Choose pesticide B. And that was that was the kind of the start of codified, written down conservation biocontrol yeah. was just choosing pesticides more judiciously. And so was, roughly like how long ago would that time have been when that really started to enter the decision making process on farms? Late, I'd say late 40s. It was becoming oh, really? inklings. Um, yeah. And then especially 50s, 60s, again, where more pesticide choices were being developed. Um, and mm-hmm. actually one of the very first, I'm very proud of this. Uh, conservation biological control programs that was really well studied, written down, and codified happened right here in Washington Tree Fruit. Uh, so there's a a former WSU professor named Stan Hoyt, uh, who in his position at the Tree Fruit Entomology uh, Lab at Wenatchee, Washington, found that there was a predatory mite that had developed resistance to a very particular pesticide called guthion mm-hmm. that they were spraying for coddling moth. Mm. And he realized that if you stuck to guthion, and I will say we don't use guthion anymore because it's really harmful to people too. Mm -hmm. But in in that case, in that time period, if you stuck to using guthion for coddling moth control, avoided some other things that that predator might wasn't resistant to, you could keep your coddling moth populations down, but at the same time have these predator mites around that were keeping spider mite populations Mm. Suppressed, So they weren't causing all this damage to the trees. And there was a year where they had a uh, really severe, I think it was a drought, and they let some of the orchards kind of go. Mm-hmm. And you could tell by driving down the highway which ones were following Stan's program and which ones weren't because the ones that were had green trees. Wow. And so it was a very, I think that was one of the dramatic, like, you know, it's always hard to get implementation because that's a risk the growers got to take when they first trust you and try something new. And this was just a, just look, it's very clear that this can work for you if you implement it. So it, it's a really cool part of the history of integrated pest management that happened right here in Washington. So I think about bugs in food and farming and like, of course, you don't want the bad bugs that are eating your plants, eating your, particularly eating the stuff that you're trying to raise for people to eat. But the other parts of the plants, like you say, too. But then there's another issue of you just don't want bugs in the product when you send it to the grocery store or wherever you're sending it for people to eat. So what about that? Maybe you put, you know, maybe there are good bugs around that are eating the other bad bugs, but then do they then become a contaminant at some point? That, like that can happen. So it's not it's not a big of a problem in the tree fruit industry because a mm. lot of our beneficial insects will either die in cold storage or like mm-hmm. all the the treatment processes they go through, like the washing and and all of that. So that's not usually an issue for us. Um, it is a really big issue in processing vegetables. I've worked in processing vegetables previously. Things like lettuce, where things get jammed into that head and it's very hard to get out. Yeah. Um, processing uh, sweet corn corn and beans where if you've got you know just one that has a caterpillar in it especially if you think about what happens in the canning process it involves boiling and and boiled insects float (laughs) so so the first thing the very first thing someone sees when they open that can is what they think is a worm and it's it's a dead caterpillar floating on the top of their can and it's one of those things where i think at that point because in order to get rid of that to get contamination to zero which is frequently what people want yeah you have to spray so many pesticides and eventually Mm -hmm. it still doesn't quite get it to zero always be there's something gonna, that gets through so i think part of it is education like teaching people that like our food comes from outside mm-hmm. there are bugs outside sometimes bugs end up in food and it's okay so uh, do we need like a cultural shift on that i think we do imperfect produce um yeah. but the other one is in especially for vegetables that are processed uh is working on equipment that can sort by color and weight and be able to remove some of those contaminants most people are grossed out by bugs mm-hmm. you're bug scientist you work with bugs every day yep 
Do they gross you out? Mostly not. Uh, I mean, there are things that can surprise me, and that's always unpleasant. Like, you know, if you've got a spider on the back of your neck and it crawls up yeah. on your head, that's not, it's not a fun surprise to have happen. Uh, but no, in general, I'm not, I'm not icked out by insects. I guess part of the ick for me is never knowing, like, A, what bug is that that's crawling on me, and B, what could it do to me? Like, could it bite me? Could it, you know, leave me itching or hurting or could it be poisonous or I, I don't know. What is it that makes people like freaked out by bugs, grossed out by bugs? I think I think a lot of it is a lack of familiarity, like not not knowing yeah. what could possibly happen or what could it do? Could it make you sick? Is it an actual health concern? Uh, a lot of people that have um, legitimate phobias of insects will talk yeah. about the legs, the le- like it's just too many legs. <laughs> Uh, There was actually an article that came out a few years ago about entomologists that were arachnophobic. And apparently it's that extra pair of legs (laughs) that does it for some people. I don't know. Because technically an insect has six. Yeah, and that extra pair of legs, when you get to eight legs with the spiders, that's... Arachnid eight legs. Too many legs. (laughs) I don't know. I like spiders. I work with spiders, too. Are there any, like, four-legged bugs out there? There, So there are, uh, well, one, they can lose their legs all the time. So, yeah, you can can just find them out and about. They're not supposed to have four legs. But uh, some of the mites that I work with, actually, so mites are also arachnids. They're supposed to. The basic body plan is to have eight. Uh, But some groups have evolved to have fewer than eight legs. And there is one mite that I work with, uh, well, a couple. They're in the uh, rust mite group. Uh, so they're very, very, very tiny. You can't see them without a microscope. And they uh, they have four legs. And they're all jammed at the front of their body. And so when they move around, if you're watching them under a microscope, they look like little worm carrot-shaped things just mm. sort of scooching themselves awkwardly mm. across the floor like a like a fat seal. Yeah, I think people hear mites and they don't know because you can't – they're so small. Yeah. Like there are times, if it's a larger mite, if I'm correct, where you can kind of sort of yeah, see yeah, them yeah. with the naked eye. But you can't really even see them in detail at that point, right, to yeah, know what with, they are. with a few exceptions. There are some species of velvet mites that are nice and chonky, like about mm. an inch long. Oh, jeez. And, 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 and ticks are actually a, a subgroup of mites. Oh, really? Yeah. No so, way. So those, those are big enough, obviously, for us to see. But in general, most mites, if I, if I put one of the mites I work on down on a white surface, you could see a little dot moving around, and that would mm. be about it. I think maybe that's part of the ick factor when people hear that word, mite, is like, almost like an infection, not mm-hmm. quite a virus, but like, because I think people he- think of like dust mites in their house. That's like the most common interaction, I think, with the mite idea. I know like in raspberries, it was always the two spotted spider mite. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of ours in tree fruit too. And we're, so my dad was always talking about that. And for a while I, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, and finally he got out his little, you know, scouting magnifying glass because he loved to take that out in the field and look at bugs and, oh, oh, so that's what a mite is. Um, But there again, like when people don't know what those things are, how are they supposed to deal with them and even understand them being on their food? Well, some mite might be on your food. You might eat it and never know. Yeah, you would never know. I'm sure I've eaten hundreds, if not thousands, of mites in my time working on them because they're just everywhere when aren't, you work with them. Aren't there stats on that? Like how many bugs people actually eat and aren't oh, aware that, of? Oh, that one while you're sleeping, how many spiders you eat while you're sleeping. Yeah. That one is that one is uh, pretty commonly debunked because the question that always comes up then is, well, how would you know that? Were you watching people with cameras while they were sleeping to yeah. find that out? So, yeah, no, <laughs> people, people don't eat that many uh, spiders while they're sleeping. But we do eat a lot of insect parts in our food because we've got allowable limits from the yeah. FDA on, on insect parts in our food. And again, people probably grossed out by that, but I think we're at kind of a tipping point where we're realizing our food doesn't have to be pristinely clean, and in fact, we may not want it to be. What do you prefer when you eat food? I mean, so I I garden a lot, yeah, and I mean, I wash my prudos pretty well after I pick it from the garden, because there are pathogens in the soil that people shouldn't be eating. We have a lot of neighborhood cats that like to use our backyard as a litter box. That needs to not be on the fruit, but... So that could be like E. coli or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, listeria, yeah, salmonella. All the all the all the things that come from not wanting your food to touch animal feces, which is yeah. you know a good thing to be <laughs> concerned about. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, you know, if we see something, you know, we we've had issues with various caterpillars getting into our our brassica and broccoli and cabbage that we grow, and we'll just pick it out and keep going. As long as you know, cut around the spot where it was chewing, because it's just going to get moldy anyway, right there. Right. Otherwise, just Damage. yeah, whatever. 
Yeah. What well, it's yeah. Or uh, jokingly, extra protein. Yeah. If you if you happen to get one. Are these bugs actually high in protein? Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of a lot of insects that are high in protein. Like they're they're selling like uh, caterpillar or, uh, cookies, um, cricket based flour uh, as like bodybuilder stuff. Like those are no those are high end bodybuilder products. Yeah, back to your mention early on there of the people working on bugs you can eat. So that's actually like bug farming then? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's like the super basic, I'd say bug farming, which is just finding what you find and eating it, which uh, tends mm-hmm. to happen with uh, insects that come out in big numbers. So I had a, a friend that did some work. She's an anthropologist. She did some work in the uh, the Congo, and they would go out when, during caterpillar season, and mm-hmm. you could hear them dropping from the trees. And they go out, and they get them, and they basically push their guts out using a stick because they said the guts didn't taste good, and then you'd cook mm-hmm. them up and eat them. It's because they were very abundant and so it was a good mm-hmm. a good nutritious food source and now you're seeing a lot of folks exchanging recipes on the uh the brood x cicadas online supposedly they taste kind of like lobster and yeah, what's this whole cicada thing that's been going on so you know we don't explain get that don't, I, I, here i have a chance yeah, to talk to a real yeah. bug scientist so about it we don't get to experience the joy of cicadas here in washington we have some native species they're small but they don't come out in swarms like that so they're a lot harder to find I'm from Kansas in the Midwest. We would get annual cicadas every single year. And when you say the joy, you, you say that sarcastically. I don't. I don't. They're you you this, like it? That's it's the singing so, noise. The singing is very. Uh, it's it's like a soothing rhythmic, and I mean, you just know it's thousands of voices all yeah. singing together. Uh, so you get the annuals, and then right now, what they're called, you know, the brood X is the periodical cicada. So those only come out uh, every. I think it's fourteen. I'm not a cicada biologist. Every fourteen or seventeen years uh, so they spend all the rest of their lifetime in the ground as a juvenile and they have that one chance to come up sing their hearts out find find the one they love and and then That's go ahead so and, crazy so yeah. such a long life span life cycle i guess for them yeah for the size of isn't that the way it is like with animals like typically the smaller they are the shorter Typically, yes, yes. Like They're, mice live to be, you know, two, three years old. Elephants live to be really long. Whales even longer. It's that sh- that quick metabolism. Uh, but yeah, no, not these guys. That's crazy, crazy stuff. When did you want to become a bug scientist? Oh man, so uh, I actually recently, I would say like a year ago, my parents sent me like stuff from, they're like, we need to get your crap out of our basement. (laughs) And it was, you know, just all this different stuff from school. And I found a few things from elementary school where they make you color in things. I was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wrote, I I think I wrote scientist, but I I mean, you know, that's, you know, second grader trying to spell the word scientist. Uh, So I've, I've, I've always liked interacting with animals and nature and that's kind of, you know, it's come and gone. Like there was one time when the show CSI was really popular and I was convinced I wanted to do crime scene investigation that was short lived. Uh, But I've always wanted to do something with working with animals, learning about how the environment works. Uh, Insects were interesting to me, but I also was that kid that really liked snakes and lizards. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I bounced around between what, you know, what do I want to work on? And, uh, starting my biology degree, I had a, a major pr- uh, advisor who worked on a species of horse called the Przewalski horse. Uh, and she said, you know, if you want to work on something big and charismatic, and I know you like predators, she's like, mm-hmm. if you work on something like say cougars, you're a good chunk of your time is going to be spent looking at tracking collar dots on a map Mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to get into these really mechanistic experiments about their behavior. You can't jam two cougars together most of the time and see what they're going to do or how they're going to interact with their environment. Because if you want to do those kinds of mechanistic experiments with predators where you can do very specific manipulations, you need to look at fish or bugs. I am not a fish person. (laughs) So I immediately said, okay, Bugs it is. And that's kind of that was kind of the, the takeoff. So I actually did an undergrad research project on the Chinese praying mantis, which is the big, the big one. And uh, I was looking at graduate schools, and I had applied to be in uh, one professor's program at Washington State, and that interaction had kind of petered out. I got an email from somebody I hadn't applied to work with and mm. said, you know, you wrote in your application you're interested in working in predators, and I see that you did stuff with praying mantises. How small are you willing to go? And are you okay with mm-hmm. doing really applied agricultural work as opposed yeah. to basic ecology and behavioral research? And I said, yes, yes to all of that. And little did I know I was agreeing to work on predatory mites. 
And once you found that out, what did you say? Still yes. <laughs> still yes. And uh, I still work on I still work on mites to this day. I've worked mm. on mites in almost every position I've had since grad school. Wow. So when did food come into the equation for you, I guess, at that point, once you took that on? Because then it was really about the interaction of bugs and food. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately. So uh, my, my, my family, uh, my, my mom's father, they're, they all farm. Uh, we're, mm. She's the one sibling that didn't stick around in, in the farming town. But, you know, I, we go visit all the time. You know, I'd have yeah. fun bottle feeding the calves and being around agriculture. But it never occurred to me that, like, for someone that's interested in science, that those two things can come together. And also, you know, as a kid, you don't you want to be cool. You don't want to do the thing that everyone else is doing, and every, yeah. everyone else being my cousins, that's what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so it was really like the desire to want to understand ecology questions and behavior questions about the world around me that ended up kind of sucking me into agriculture. Mm -hmm. And then I found that hey, one. Uh, agriculture is an oversimplified ecological system, which means you can do really cool manipulations because everything else is already fairly consistent across mm -hmm. the board. Ask very specific questions about basic ecology and behavior. But in the same day, you can work on a completely different research project that does a very focused, addresses questions about what growers are needing and actually make a big difference in people's day-to-day -day lives. And so I kind of got hooked on it, and, and uh, yeah. especially the working with farmers and, and providing them advice and having them teach me about what their problems were and how they were currently dealing with them. And uh, that, that also ended up being like a really fun aspect of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, what's it like working with farmers? It's Awesome. Uh, so I, I they think aren't like uh, scientists. What do you know? I've been out <laughs> here like working on this stuff, and you're just coming from the lab, the ivory tower. <laughs> you know. I guess I've had the benefit of everything I've done post undergrad has been involved with uh, land grant universities, so they mm -hmm. are more. You know, that's that's the, those are the people they want to listen to, yeah. right? Like we've got more of a finger on the pulse than the typical, uh, you know, the stereotypical ivory tower person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but also, I think you're not going to find in any other scientific field a more invested stakeholder group because this mm. impacts day to day what they're seeing. Um, and especially like farmers that are really into going out into their farms and seeing what's happening out there, they come up with some really cool research questions mm. um, or like, you know, we've tried X, Y and Z. I, I, it's, it's going okay, but I just need to figure out how to make this, how do, how do I optimize that? And that's kind of where I come in is how do we optimize what you're doing right now and, and make it profitable and sustainable? I guess there is that perception that farming and science aren't necessarily maybe as close together as they actually are because you have to, to survive in the current climate. I mean, they've got to be super efficient. They're under a lot of pressure. There are all these things that they're juggling on the farm, farmers have to at least somewhat think like a scientist. Oh yeah, no, some 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 farmers basically they they are scientists. When they're out there and they want to try something and they say, "Okay, you know, I've got four blocks of apples and I did the thing I want to try to three of them and I didn't I didn't touch the other one. I just want to see if that one looks like worse than the other three do. Like that's an experiment. Yeah. It's it's you know, it's not as replicated as we would make it or as controlled as we would make it, but there that would be what we would call great preliminary data to start mm -hmm. off a, a a big project with. So in your day-to-day -day dealing with bugs, how much are you thinking about that food ultimately at the end of this whole process? Uh, so I think I'm maybe a little more removed from the food uh, just because okay. I'm, I'm one, I w we'll call it, uh, the, we'll use the fancy scientific term, I'm one, too many trophic levels removed from it. Uh, so yeah. tr troph is eating. Right. Uh, so, you know, if you're having something that's eating a plant, that's one trophic level up. I'm two trophic levels up from the actual fruit that's going out. Um, so for me, it's typically looking at the very end of a project, especially if we've been working on a grower's farm and looking at... For instance, if we are trying releases of predators, looking at the pest levels before and after and going, is would this be enough? Like, Because I can see that these are different. Like this did bring the pest down a bit. Is this enough to impact the pack out in that particular orchard for this year? And so that's that's kind of where I sit there going, you know, I can't, that last piece can sometimes be tr pretty tricky to get at, especially for these pests that don't directly feed on the fruit because it's hard to say, like, did I help enough that maybe two years from now if I keep doing this, right, this will be right. helpful. 
But really, you do have a hand in the quality of that product that somebody's going to buy and ingest into their bodies. I would hope so. That's kind of that's kind of our uh, that's the thing with the, a lot of this research is you're on the front end of trying something new and and you know yeah. implementation wide scale might be ten years down the line so you're just saying I really hope this helps right. Let's talk about pesticides. There are so many misconceptions, good and bad, about pesticides. And you were talking about you know using beneficials predators to eat the bad bug, good bugs, bad bugs. You know let the war happen tip the scales hopefully in favor of the good guys, but you also talked about how that can fit with using pesticides. How much could we ever get away from that? Like how much does that do pesticides man-made and, and that could be an organic product or a synthetic product. How much is that necessary in these systems? Cause I think some people have the ideal that well, we could do away with that entirely. Is that possible? I'd say probably not, especially one, if we still continue our desire for perfect produce. Yeah. And two, given the cost that these growers put into maintaining a tree, they've got to get enough fruit out of that tree at the end of the day to, to justify that tree's existence in their orchard. And, uh, I mean, we've got a research orchard out here in, in Moxie. It's about 20 minutes away from where we are now. Mm -hmm. I know what those trees look like, and we don't spray them for research purposes. Mm -hmm. And they're, it's gross. It's gross out there at the end of the season because we get coddling moth in almost every single apple. Mm -hmm. We don't pick it because we we, we're not harvesting it for fruit. We're just using it for right. research. They hit the ground, and you have rotten <laughs> caterpillar-covered apples all over the ground. Uh, and that's what it would look like if a grower didn't spray or do other management practices. So I think there's a balance between mm. saying we don't need any pesticides at all and saying what's my heaviest hitter? Yeah, let, right. me, let me nuke, Dump it, it, to it. nuke it repeatedly yeah. and, and, and go for it. And, yeah, I think that's, that's part of our job is, to, is yeah. to find that that medium where can we be sustainable but also economical. Yeah. Are there people who farm that way, though? Like just dump it, just nuke everything out? I mean – my, from I've, my background, it's like, we couldn't afford to do that. So we're just kind of barely scrimping by on what we can. I've met a few. Uh, it's it's primarily the uh, really, really cheap, like, generic pyrethroids. Because those, mm. are, those are easy to put in a tank and are not costing that's you. True. But 12, 12, bucks, 12 bucks an acre, maybe. Yeah. Why, and that's that. Then the attitude becomes, you know, why the hell not? <laughs> uh -huh. Might as well. It's insurance. And I think that's it's a bigger problem in state and states that are more humid. So I don't think we mm. experience, except for maybe on the west side. But here we don't yeah. experience that. In states that are humid, they're dealing with fungal pathogens, and that means yeah. they're spraying every week, or they're losing if they're doing a fruiting crop like a, you know, melons, cucumbers, tomatoes, what have you. If they're not spraying every week, they're losing it to fungal pathogens. And at that point, you got the tractor out, put the insecticide side in uh, the yeah. tank is the logic that goes with yeah. that and I, I get it I get that idea but at the same yeah. time it's it's helping those people get rid of the risk aversion and saying well ease back and see what happens yeah and from your pr perspective as a scientist if somebody does that you're probably thinking whoa 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 I, you were talking earlier about the balance could that totally like oh yeah knock something way out of balance way way out of balance so uh, and actually like make the problem worse in cases usually what you end up doing is you maybe fix the problem you were trying to fix and you create a different problem for yourself and the big yeah. the big one is mites um so in particular you know you mentioned working with two spotted spider mite we work with two spotted spider mite so that that critter is a pest on hundreds of different crops it is a very broad generalist and so what that means for it biologically speaking is it's got all kinds of cellular machinery and enzymes that are really good at detoxifying plant compounds when plants are trying to defend themselves. Right. Those same enzymes can be used to detoxify pesticides. It also can reproduce at a rate of about one generation per week, uh, depending on how hot it is outside. So you've got... An, because they're so tiny. They're very tiny. Back to what we were talking about, about the size of the animal relating to the life cycle. Yes. And, and what mites do is basically just chew on the green material of plants, their leaves, and... Stop photosynthesis, essentially, yeah, right? Yeah, they, they basically suck out the contents of the cell like a straw, and then it's gone, yeah. they move on to the next one. And, and, I mean, it's super convenient for them because it's like being a cow in a pasture that's completely full of grass. They just every they just, can, just constantly barely move, keep eating, and reproducing. And then with that short life cycle you were saying, then they can quickly become resistant to stuff? Yes, they can. So between those detoxifying enzymes, the short life cycle – 
and the fun fact about their reproduction. So normally it takes two to tango. You need a female and a male mite to get together yeah. on a leaf to have any kind of juvenile mites. Yeah. Uh, fun thing about these mites is they don't need to do that. So if you have one single female that just happens to be carrying a resistance trait to some pesticide, she mm. lands somewhere. All of her offspring, if she's unfertilized, are males and viable. And she can actually mate with her own sons to produce a completely viable population of males and females from one. All it takes is one female mite. So between all of those things, they are what is called the most notorious pest for resistance development in the world. Crazy. And yeah, think about, I mean, we think about evolution on the scale of like human evolution or larger mammals and how long that takes but if you have a new generation every week or two, fast. It happens very fast. Incredibly fast. It's amazing they haven't taken over the world yet. Yeah. No, and and they may. So <laughs> that, that may. gets you that gets you back to so, you know, in, in agriculture, especially since like the, the 80s, everyone uses pyrethroids in every crop for everything. Mm-hmm. And spider mites are in every crop feeding on almost everything. And pyrethroids are what we call a broad-spectrum pesticide. They basically kill any insect that comes into contact with it, which includes your beneficial insects. But because spider mites can develop resistance so quickly, they become resistant to the pyrethroids. The natural enemies don't. And so now, it, pyrethroids, aren't they based like a synthetic version of a, a naturally occurring yeah, yeah. chemical? Yeah, pyrethrum. So you can buy an organic, uh, closely related product. Um, that's, that's pyrethrum. Because what plant is that from? Uh, I believe it's chrysanthemums. Yes, yes. My father has told me this. He would be disappointed to hear that (laughs) I didn't remember that factoid because he's told me multiple times. What about the difference then, since we're on that point, between synthetic, traditional, conventional pesticides and organic pesticides? I think a lot of people don't recognize that pesticides are also used in organic production. What is the difference between that? I've heard... Multiple things. You know, some people say, oh, they're so much better. Other people are like, no, they're actually worse because you have to apply more and they're really harsh. At least from the bug perspective, how do you see that playing out? I'm going to do the classic scientist answer. It depends. It depends, mm. yeah. <laughs> so there, right. there are some, which uh, and, and the pyrethrum would be a case of this, that are broad spectrum. Um, the main reason they're not as harmful as the pyrethroids is they decay faster under temperature and UV, so their residues don't last as long. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, toxicity is pretty high. Uh, yeah. There are other products, too, that are, are pretty broadly toxic to a bunch of different kinds of insects that are organic. But then on the flip side of that, we have some really cool new things that people are developing, uh, the biologicals, mm. which tend to be based on toxins produced by specific bacteria or other mm. microorganisms that are more particular to the kinds of insects they go after. And of course, the classic example that a lot of folks in agriculture know is, is BT. And BT really only impacts, in the case of the one that most people use, is, is caterpillars. So you're not going to have harm to anything that's not a caterpillar in your in your farm, and mm-hmm. that that makes it a pretty pretty selective organic option. So how do how do they produce that? How do they make that happen? Oh man, I'm not a pesticide manufacturer. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of steps in the process, but I mean, the, the first one was recognizing that there was a bacteria that produced a toxin mm-hmm. uh, that that impacts insects' guts, and it, and it basically causes rupturing, and they die because they can't get nutrition anymore from the food that they're eating. So then they have to be able to figure out how to produce that uh, in a lab artificially right. in quantity. And they just fig- figure out a whole what- bunch of bacteria. There's yeah. one very specific bacteria that ex caterpillar doesn't like whatever it is yeah yeah and put it out there yeah it's crazy where we've gotten to with all of this from you know pesticides being a poison versus a pesticide being something that's very targeted and really may be something that's not poisonous at all to anything else but to that one thing yeah yeah and I think that's where we're going to go, and it's going to make things better in terms of sustainability, but I think it's also going to make things more complicated from yeah. a grower perspective because it used to be you had a few things, and they all did a good job on most stuff, and maybe you had to have a couple other products for specific issues, but mm-hmm. but that was it. And now I think as people are going selective uh, and starting to ease back, they're having other problems that, like, mm. you know, you'd read these old journals that would say, oh, you know, this is only a problem in unsprayed backyard apple trees. 
And I'm like, well, you're making your farmscape, for better or for worse, like an unsprayed backyard apple tree, at least in the case of that pest. So we've got things that we have to readdress every time we, we alter our management. So organic versus conventional, when someone looks at that, does that really tell the whole story? It definitely doesn't. Uh, you can have, you know, an organic farm that's had the bejesus sprayed out of it, and as mm. long as they've stayed within their legal limits, they're, they have their organic certification. And, uh, you know, big examples I see out here of what I would call, like, good conventional farming are coming from our tree fruit growers that are using mating disruption for their coddling moss, so no mm -hmm. pesticides involved. They're being very particular about what they spray and when to not harm their natural enemies. And obviously, I think the average person would prefer that to somebody that's technically following all the rules of organic, but maybe not the spirit of it. Right. And that's where rule the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law, it really is what it comes down to on either side, it sounds like. The MO, the mentality, the understanding of the, the person running the system. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why you're starting to see some states wanting to create what's called you know, like an IPM label or mm -hmm. a sustainable la label where it's something that's saying, you know, this person does use conventional insecticides, but they do it in a very responsible manner. Um, and, and I think that that might be better than organic, but we'll, we'll see yeah. if anybody manages to get, get that going. Well, and I think the, the point that a lot of people, organic people, conventional people have all told me is the problem is the label and this like binary yes or no perspective, which doesn't really add up. And that fits with what you're saying as a scientist. It depends. Mm -hmm. And so a label, well, yes, but it depends. So any label that could potentially be, you know, cooked up may not be able to tell the whole story. I guess what's important is to know the people that are actually producing that food. Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, like a lot of people are now realizing I'd rather go local because then I can ask yeah. questions and talk to the person uh, as, yeah. a, as opposed to, you know, show up in, you know, a big chain commercial, uh, grocery store. You, yeah. don't, you don't know. Yeah, and yeah, if, especially if food is produced overseas or what kind of regimen were they following or, you know, regulations were they under – what, what about that? Yeah, well, how much different is this kind of management, at least of bugs, that being your specialty here in Washington versus other parts of the country or outside of this country? Are people doing the same thing everywhere? Or I would like to think that here in Washington we're kind of ahead of the curve because I, I, I know we I have feel, a lot of people working on this. I feel like we're pretty ahead of the curve here. Um, I, I, I think worldwide it is widely variable, and I think mm -hmm. it, it not just from country to country depending upon rules – what tools are available, education levels that are available to people on how to use things safely. Um, it just, just it, it can be incredibly difficult to farm in some places and be, yeah. be sustainable and to get the information that, that those folks need to do what they need to do. Um, there's some really cool stuff uh, going on in Europe. I think that's kind of on the cutting edge of, of doing organic research because they grow a lot of their stuff in glass houses, uh, things that we would never think of growing in glass houses because we've got so much space in the United right. States. They're growing it in glass houses yeah. where you can be a little more controlled with what you're doing. Uh, there's some cool work coming out of, of Brazil. Uh, so I think all over the world we're seeing really cool innovations in sustainable agriculture. Um, a lot of folks returning to, uh, you know, older sustainable practices that are part of their traditional cultures because they're like actually the way we did it 200 years ago was actually it was a pretty good way of doing it Let, like let's go back to more like that how can we make it more like that and still turn a profit yeah, i'm seeing more and more examples of you folks in the world of science basically verifying through science the reasons why some of those older practices were good where back in the day maybe they just did it because that's what they did and you know it had been passed on for generations well you just do it this way Someone may have not known at all the scientific reason why it was effective. But I see a lot of cases where you folks are doing research out in the field and saying, you know, this is what's happening. You know, I see it a lot with soil health, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, um, soil bugs. There's another whole world. Oh, man, yeah, that's a whole, a lot of, uh, especially bigger entomology departments have their own, like, soil ecologist that's, that's based in yeah. insects. Because, I mean, soil health has become such a, big focus and I think rightly so in the last 10 years especially 
And as my dad always says, he talks about the communities of pathogens and good guys, you know, beneficials and everything that's going on. And it's, he's like, we know so little about what's happening beneath our feet. So there's another world. Um, sounds like you get to deal with the bugs that are not beneath our feet as much, though. Not not so much. Uh, they're, they're, I have some colleagues that do biological control work with nematodes that attack, oh, especially yeah. caterpillars that, that will form their pupae in the ground. And so th- that's where those folks really come in into the biological control worlds. It would be so much harder to find those bugs down there because then you've got to disturb the soil, and then are you really looking at... Soil ecology is rough. Yeah, there and there's, you know, there, every, you know, everybody thinks the way they do it is right. And so, you know, I, I talked to uh, one of the soil ecologists I've worked with in the past. You know, he said there are two attitudes towards if you're going to do an experiment with field-collected soils. You either take your core and you don't disturb it at all. You keep it exactly the way it was. He goes, but, you know, when you've collected it, you've compacted that core and you've disturbed the outer edges. He goes, or you go the other way with it and, like, homogenize it, get rid of all the big chunks of matter. Mm-hmm. So at least it's a little more spread out and fluffy. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I go with the homogenization. There are other people that go with the cores. It's, it's one of those fights where it's like, I don't know that anybody's really right. Just do what works for your study. What was it like going way back to the beginning when you said you were in second grade and knowing that you wanted to get in science? That's become a big focus um, in recent years, you know, STEM education for everybody, but particularly for girls. What was that like for you growing up? Uh, I was that kid that liked to crawl around in the dirt and look at things in the yeah. dirt. So uh, frequently I had very supportive, especially in elementary school, because, you know, yeah. the teachers are all trying to be very nurturing. So I had my kindergarten teacher was especially good about like, yeah, check out whatever books you want on dinosaurs, bugs, whatever. Uh, and then some people don't quite understand what's happening when a kid's doing that, especially if they're supposed yeah. to be playing with the other kids at recess. So I actually right. had one teacher that I'm trying to remember exactly what my mom, She of course, she didn't tell me this until I was an adult, but she said, yeah, she thought you had some kind of social disorder didn't <laughs> didn't know how to interact with other people and she she also thought that you were never going to be able to write proficiently for your age like you never mm. would match the people that were in your age group uh and i just it's one of those things where you just kind of go <laughs> <laughs> i was like i'm actually a really good writer <laughs> nah, nah. lady <laughs> yeah. that's awesome so yeah what um i, I don't know was that ever was it like that's not a girl thing i don't know if we're from the generation where that started to really change i I feel like i'm I'm part of that started to really change thing so i i never felt like that wasn't a girl thing i felt like that was kind of an odd thing but i think they would have said it was odd if it was a little boy crawling around the ground with his face this close to most things too so i i think we've moved away from discouraging young girls that that's not that's not what girls do and i think now it's more about as they're moving into high school school and college saying, no, this, this is something you are capable of. Um, and then when they do enter that field, making it a welcoming environment. And I mean, that's true of anybody that doesn't see a lot of people that look or act like them in a given field is yeah. you have to make sure that they're, they're actually welcome there and not just that you're saying that they are. So you're checking a diversity checkbox. Right. For sure. Yeah. What's your sense of that in the general science world? I mean, cause that, that was, that's the stereotype is that, well, it's still, you know, um, heavy on, you know, men and low on diversity and things like that. But is it, I mean, I think I feel like it's changing and there are diverse perspectives coming into that world. Is that something that you're seeing and experiencing? I I think we're getting there. I think more people are realizing, especially people in positions of power are realizing, and I mean, by say positions of power, I mean like tenured professors. I don't mean like, you know, somebody really high up in government, but people in positions of power are realizing like, oh, this actually is a problem for people. And just because it's never affected me doesn't mean it's not right. an issue that's out there. So I think we're, we're, tr- we're trying at least. And I think that's better than not trying, which was maybe how it was you know, several decades ago. Uh, we have a long way to go, I think. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a lot, especially I'd say in academia, which you have to go through if you want to be a scientist. You have right. to get an advanced degree of some kind where there are a lot of unwritten traditions that can mm. push people away without realizing it or cut off opportunities because they didn't write their opening email to that professor just right and didn't do the things that they were supposed that they were supposed to do and didn't know that they were supposed to do. So I think that's that's a big push we need to make is is being more open and understanding that you know not everybody can do exactly what you're expecting of them and just because they can't doesn't mean they're not going to be really great at this. Yeah. Especially if it's something as insignificant as how an opening email is worded, you know, like 
let's put the focus on the important things like actual work that's happening yeah, and, yeah. you know let's get smart people that should be the filter right you yeah, know, yeah people who are passionate and, and want to dig in so well thank you for explaining this world of bugs and farming at least a little bit i mean what else should I, it has to be so deep and complicated once you get below the surface what do people, what should people take away, I guess, if they're listening to this conversation about bugs and their food and the science that goes into that? I think that's thing number one is it is when we, when we pause and someone asks a question, you go, well, it's complicated or that depends. <laughs> it, it, it really is. We're not trying to be snarky. It is complicated yeah. and it depends. Uh, so we, there's so much happening, so much happening. And I mean, that's the big appeal to me as someone that came in from a more like basic biology, ecology. There's so much happening in some cases on a single leaf where that's, that's that animal's whole world for their entire yeah. life. And it's like a, the savanna is happening with the lions and, and the gazelles <laughs> are happening on that little leaf that uh, generalizing up to scale for a whole farm or recommending management strategies for an entire state can be really challenging, but also really exciting. Well, I'm glad that you're on the good bug team. It sounds like it's an ongoing war, good bugs versus the bad bugs. And I'm hoping for the good bugs to win out in the end, because really that's the best way, especially if, if you can have, you know, biological controls like you work on to minimize or even maybe in some cases eliminate the need for synthetic products. Awesome. I think everybody wins in that case. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably more economical to do too. So good for you for doing that. We need smart people creating these kinds of solutions for our food system um, and beyond, of course. So thanks for what you do and, and sharing your, your story here on the podcast. No worries. Yeah, no, and thanks thanks for all the folks that have decided that this is a thing that they want to have happen and have supported me, especially in the industry, saying that, yeah, we want somebody that works on biological control at your unit doing this work. So that it has taken that support even from like farmers and industry. Oh to yeah, make that yeah. Happen? No, we're we're very um, like our you know we have a stakeholder base and you know they have mm -hmm. their leaders and and those leaders are the ones that talk to the because we're not supposed to talk to legislation or right. have have any right. kind of you know we're we're uh, we provide information not policy decisions. That's the right. that's the core of of what ARS does in terms of its its action interactions with the other policy making arms of the federal government. So it, it's up to our stakeholders to say this is what we. We want to see at this unit, you know, at a, at a wider scale within the USDA in terms of research. We want to see this, and that's how people get hired, how people decide, you know, we get a new piece of equipment, how, how all the big moving and shaking happens is, is from influential stakeholders saying, hey, our industry needs this. And so you're saying influential people specifically within tree fruit here want somebody working on something that <laughs> may see may be seen by some as kind of like out there or you know a little bit hippie or you know organic but they care enough they care. They to care. say let's fund this let's do this we want these solutions in that realm not just hey we're going to open up another bottle of pesticides and yeah no absolutely i have actually that's encouraging to hear. i i started out in this industry working in agriculture and you know went elsewhere and then came back when this position opened up and i always tell people i was spoiled starting out in this industry because mm. i mean we're talking about a group of growers who'll say hey i found a surfeit egg and like hand me a leaf and so i'm like surfeit is the scientific family name of a hoverfly and there are so many farm managers that know they know that word and they know exactly what they're talking about uh, my favorite one is they call their, their predator mites tiffs, and that's a shortened version of the name Tiflodromus, which is the scientific genus that that mite used to be, <laughs> used to be and taxonomy is yeah. crazy, but yeah. they know that. And so it's, it's coming from people that know their beneficial insects so well and know how important mm. they are. Like that, that appreciation for what you do and, and, and breaking ground in new areas of that field is, is so important to me. And, you know, it makes me feel good at the end of the day that, that people are caring and, and listening to this information we're putting out. So the farmers actually know quite a bit about what they're doing out there, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, they are, like awesome. I said, they're, they're scientists running their own experiments out in their fields. So cool. Well, thanks again for having me. No worries. Thanks for coming. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. <laughs>